John chapter 1, John chapter 21, verses 15 to 19. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. There's one thing that you can say about me. Well, there are many things you could say about me and sometimes people do say some things about me that I wish they didn't, but uh, one thing that you can say, to, uh, say about me, which I think is very honest, is that I'm persistent. Um, it was a little over two years ago that I started preaching through the Gospel of John. And we are now about within two weeks of finishing the Gospel of John in our week-by-week -week teaching. Um, that doesn't mean we've always been teaching from the Gospel of John on a Sunday, you know, things like Christmas come along and Easter and things of that kind. But it is enough that when Isabel announces what I'm preaching on today and she says John chapter 1, it's enough to give me palpitations because it makes it sound like there's another two years in the offing. But there isn't. Um, today, um, in our analysis of what happened to people after the resurrection, we come to Simon Peter and then finally next week we will come to John the Gospel writer himself. So we think about John today, uh, sorry about Peter today and his relationship with Jesus. Now Peter, you will remember, his relationship had been aggravated when he denied Jesus, when Jesus was on the eve of the crucifixion. So Jesus was being, if you like, interrogated by the Roman leaders and during that time, Peter was three times asked whether he was one of Jesus' followers. And three times, he denied Jesus. Now, it is interesting within this, the three words that stand out to me are in verse 17, when it says, Peter was hurt. Peter had denied Jesus three times. Jesus asked him three times for confirmation of who he was and how he related to God. But we are allowed to be so much more sensitive than we allow others sensitivity a place or even that we allow God to have sensitivity about our relationship with him 
A Frenchman in the dim and distant past said, Of course God will forgive me. That is God's business. It's what God does. But that is not so. For example, we see very clearly that God does not forgive those who do not come and ask to be forgiven. One of the things that I ponder on very often as a pastor is that it is very easy for me to offend someone. But if I take offense at somebody, then they are slow to measure by the same measure. And that is kind of interesting. Um, if I was to say to you that there is a city in the world that is sometimes called the city of brotherly love. Would anybody know where I was referring to? Philadelphia. See, red hot. Philadelphia. And the reason that Philadelphia is called or was named Philadelphia is that phila is based upon the Greek and it means love for your brother. Now, you may have heard of the writer, noted Christian writer, C.S. Lewis, uh, who wrote a book, I believe sometime in the 1950s, called The Four Loves. And he noted that there were four words in the Greek that equally translated love. Now he developed an argument that said that those words that were translated Greek in from Greek meant different kinds of love. Now in actual fact his argument doesn't entirely hold up because in the Bible where the whole range of ideas about love are encountered, there are only two words for love used. In classical Greek, which was uh, C.S. Lewis's discipline, if I can put it they, that way, there were four. So he was both right and wrong at the same time, which is pretty good, really, if you can achieve that. Um, but one of the words that is used in the Bible is philo, um, which is where Philadelphia comes from. I'm thinking that there's a thing, philo pastry, is that right? Yeah, I have no idea how those two things are connected. I have no idea why it's called philo pastry, so don't ask me. I really, really don't know. Um, but the other word for love that is used in the New Testament is agape. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine a few years ago, and she said that um, when she was in her teens and 20s, she was in a uh, kind of a Christian gospel uh, group where she played guitar and sang, and they'd been booked to perform a concert at the Salvation Army, and this was in Barnsley, where I was born. And uh, in Barnsley, Salvation Army, they are no masters of Greek, because the gentleman who introduced the concert said, and now, ladies and gentlemen, I give you a gape, <laughs> which uh, wasn't quite what they had in mind when they chose the name. Um, and so C.S. Lewis argued that agape always means the love of God. It doesn't always in the New Testament. It doesn't work out that way. But here in 
this passage, and I don't mean to blind you with science by talking about Greek too much, um, Jesus is translated as using two different words from the Greek. In the first and third times, he asks Peter whether he loves him. He uses agape. In the second time, he uses philo. And when you have a deliberate contrast like that, it must mean something. End of today's Greek discussion. You'll be glad for. So Jesus asks Simon Peter three times, but it seems that he is asking him two different questions. And when he is Answering positively he is then given three different in instructions. So in the first and third questions, when he says, he says first, do you love me more than these? The question really is, what are these? And we're not really given an answer. I've um, heard it suggested that Simon Peter was being asked whether he loved Jesus more than the fishing boats and the fishing nets and the fishing rods or whatever people used at that time. It could equally be that he was being asked, did he loved Jesus more than his brothers and sisters who were around him. Brothers and sisters in physical terms, but also in the faith. It could also be that given that they had just finished eating and that the food had come from a huge catch, it could be do you love me more than the physical necessities? And in a way, the third one is almost the light-hearted one. But given what else is in the conversation, I think it might be the most likely one. I don't have any reason for that other than the fact that it seems to make best sense. There were going to be times in the future when Peter was going to suffer, he was going to be imprisoned, and he was going to be put to death. And a slap up three course meal was not always going to be there for him. So, was his determination for Jesus? which had fallen apart at the crucifixion, was that going to stand the test of time? You know, it is um, part of the time that I've not been at church, we spent in Whitby. And uh, I was talking to a friend the other day, um, one of the homeless guys that I work with, and uh, he said, oh, tell me what it's like. And I said, well, it's... It's good food, you know, good place to stay and all this. He said, uh, what kind of food? I said, well, it's almost entirely fish. He said, oh, that must be great. I said, you know, Tony, you can have too much of a good thing. I don't think I'm going to touch fish for months now because every day was fish. Different kinds of fish, but lots and lots of fish. And, but it was food, and you could always count on it to be there. Um, it's quite interesting. We were there for three weeks, and Serena came up to visit with us for one week. And 
every day we had kind of mussels or cockles or whelks or um, oysters, Isabel is indicating to me, and this kind of thing. And the whole week that she was there, we were trying to persuade Serena that having something of this uh, particular stall would be a good idea. And every day she said, uh-uh, I'll try it tomorrow. And then we got to the end of the week and realized that this was never going to happen. But that's because there were lots of food options, all involving fish, but still lots of options. Peter was facing a time when that might not be the case. In the second time, Peter is asked, Peter, Jesus says to him, do you love me? And here is where that contrasting word comes in. This means, do you love me as a brother? And that's something. Because we understand that as Christians, we are meant to love God with all of our being. But the second most important teaching is that we love our neighbors. And I guess within that, to love our brothers. And again here, I don't mean just our physical brothers. I mean those who we are related to by the faith. And Jesus asked Peter to confirm not only that he worshipped him as God, but that he stood shoulder to shoulder with him as a brother. And that starts with Jesus, but extends to all of our other brothers. And then by extension to our neighbors, and most amazingly, even to those who have cast themselves as our enemies. And as we started out saying, Peter said three times that he loved Jesus and he was hurt because Peter kept pressing him. And Jesus gave him three instructions. He said that he should feed his lambs. Now by lambs here, I take it to mean that there are those who are young in the faith and they need to be given the spiritual food to develop. It's a little bit like the old phrase that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Our job is to lead the horse to water. We can't force it, the water down its throat. Well, you could try if you wanted to. I'm not in the queue to do that. Uh, but we need to provide it. And it's sometimes it's the thing that sometimes the church in the 21st century is a little bit weak on. We are good at giving people feel-good experiences. Uh, we are good at providing people with friends and relationships. But good teaching, a little bit short sometimes. And so we need to, to be able to do that better. I saw something in the news the other day where um, Cliff Richard, um, well, I think he's 81 sometime this year, he's doing his 80th year concert tour 
but it's a year late because of all concerts being stopped last year. And, you know, I don't have much of an opinion about Cliff Richard. You can take him or you can leave him, really. He's a little bit middle of the road for my taste, uh, but there you go. But he made a statement in some interview with a Christian website where he said, worship should be worship. You can't make it into a concert or an event. And he was explaining in a little detail as to why perhaps sometimes he doesn't sing more gospel songs in uh, concerts where there are ladies of a certain age down the front screaming, Oh, Cliff! Cliff! And, uh, you know, it is... Um, because they're coming along to hear him sing, um, you know, we don't talk anymore, or miss you nights, or um, uh, live in doll, or I could go back a little bit further, I think. I think one of my favorites of his is Move It, which was before I was born. So uh, hey, that just proves he's older than me, if nothing else. But he has a point. Teaching has to be good teaching. Worship has to be directed to God. And things are sometimes not as good as they should be. We need to get better. Other churches need to get better. So lambs, the young converts, need to be fed. And in the current environment with COVID and everything else that has been exceptionally difficult. Secondly, people need to be taken care of. And this was Jesus' second answer. Take care of my sheep. So this applies even to those who are fully grown up. Christians who are no longer in their infancy. You know, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you go to a church for the first time and the first couple of times people are very keen to talk to you. And then the third time you're kind of, you think, oh, why did nobody speak to me today? And it's because they think, you know, you've now settled in not the way that it should be. But Jesus in his third answer makes the point as well that even for those who are sheep rather than lambs, there is a need for continuous feeding. And again, this might be a contrast with the fish, but it is not just about fish. You know, I was talking to Isabel the other day about whether we should have a Christmas lunch at church. And Isabel thinks we should have, and so on and so forth. So the turkey is provisionally ordered for the Sunday before Christmas Day. We will see what happens in the meantime. Um, so we don't bring you to church just to break you fat, although you might achieve that on the Sunday before Christmas. We bring you... To church whether you've been a Christian one year or 60 years to actually learn more and to come closer to God and to be more like Jesus and then Jesus drops a bombshell he says very truly I tell you when you were young you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And John points out that Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And this is hard. Several of the first generation of disciples were martyred for their faith, amongst them Peter. 
You might expect in verse 18 that Jesus said, Correct, Peter. You've given the three right answers. You are now top of the league, super Christian, and everything will go well for you. You'll never get sick, but if you do, God will miraculously heal you. If you put money in the offering plate, God will give you back ten times the amount you have given. I'm not parried in any particular style of preacher here, but there are those around. Um, but Jesus, if you like, does not pull his punches. Peter has passed the test in intention, at least. He had passed the test in intention before. But he was now in a situation where Jesus was going to reveal something to him. Imagine if God told you tomorrow how you were going to die. You know, it's, uh, oh, it make, makes me smile when we go on our holiday to Whitby. Every day we go to the seafood shack and get our mussels or cockles or whatever. Next door to it, there is a booth where the lady who runs the booth uh, glories in the name Lee Alita something's Rosa Lee, which occurs to me that when she was at school, she would have been Lee Lee, which is kind of weird. But, hey, each to their own. And she tells fortunes. And she says that everything on your hand reveals something about who you are. Hmm. Not sure about that. But imagine how quickly she would put herself out of business if when you went in, um, she said, okay, you're going to die next Thursday, run over by a double-decker bus. People would become a little wary of this kind of fortune-telling. Jesus does not tell fortunes in that sense because he is God. But he tells Peter, not when he is going to die, but he tells Peter that it's not going to be happy. He is going to be martyred. And it's one thing to say that Peter would glorify God. And I've no question about it that Peter would feel good about it afterwards. But it, not so at the time, perhaps. And this is how it is for all of us. Amongst the sweet life, there is suffering ahead. With age comes difficulty. With sickness comes difficulty. With living in our society comes difficulty. With listening to this sermon comes difficulty. But then in the third part of what Jesus says comes insistence. He says, follow me. And the editor of our New Testament has put an exclamation mark on the end there. There aren't any exclamation marks in Greek, so I know that he made that bit up. But he wants to put an emphasis on it. And what Jesus said when our translation says, very truly, what Jesus says is, Amen, Amen. And that means in Jesus speak, this is something you'd better listen to, Peter. Because whatever you say, this is where you're going. Amen is one of those words that Jesus used perhaps more often than any other word. It's kind of interesting that we can't find an equivalent word to translate it into the English language. 
But whatever is coming, Jesus insists that Peter and Isabel and Darren and Terence and Gary and Jenny, Ingrid, Jill, Darren, sorry, I said Darren twice, Pat, all the people who are in the other room, they live through their lives following God, despite and through the difficulties. That's hard, but it is better when difficulties come to follow God than to go through the difficulties alone. You know, there's that old poem sometimes that you see um, in Christian bookshops, if Christian bookshops still exist, the one that's called Footprints. Um, you know, uh, sometimes there were only one set of footprints. Why was that? It was because at this point, my child, I carried you. Again, it's a little bit twee for my taste, but I know some people love it. But it does encapsulate some truth. God is with us on the good days, the bad days, the boring days, and the exciting days. Amen.